Hi everyone, my name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and it is your virtual star party for Sunday, <coughs> April 21st, 2013. And so joining me tonight, uh, we've got the moon right there. But actually, we've got uh, Mark Barrent, who is uh, providing us the moon. Can we switch to you, Mark, for a second? Sure. So we can see your Chicago Mountain Man appearance, and then oh, uh, you actually want to see my face, not the yeah, moon. yeah. So okay. people know that you exist. I can do that. So he knows the there he is. I, I do indeed exist. Yeah, awesome. And uh, and so Mark, now you've got a your gear, your setup has been improving in leaps and bounds. We're not it, to blame it, in any way, are we? Um, maybe a little bit. <laughs> so what's your new setup now? Uh, the new new setup I just got is uh, a Celestron C8 on a C gem mount. So nice. it's a a pretty beefy mount for an eight inch telescope. But yeah. I hope once I put the guide scope and everything else on there, it it'll uh, even out. Go and bigger, go home, Mark. Just exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, and so I mean that's a that's a big jump up from the uh, the little you had like an LX six or something before, uh, right? It, no, it was uh, ETX ninety. So ETX ninety, yeah. So it was a little like, a little three and a half. It was a little dull. It's, it's yeah. not the size of the scope; it's how you use it. That's right. <laughs> it's yeah. the slew that you do. Yeah, it's yeah. the slew that you do. That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, cool. Well, uh, so thanks, Mark. This is great. The moon is absolutely gorgeous. And now, why is it blue? It's blue because I have my light pollution filter in, uh, so it kind of filters out everything with this kind of bluish, greenish light. And I'm colorblind, so I don't really care. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a, and it's so that got that got us singing. That got us singing. Blue moon. So we're uh, we're good. Uh, but man, the view is just is so crisp and so clear. I think this is just going to be fantastic. I'm really looking forward to us moving around the moon tonight. Uh, joining us from England is Andrew Dumbleton. Hey, Andrew, how's it going? Hey, hi, crazy. And, hi, crazy. Uh, <laughs> now and now it's, it's, it's what, like 4 in the morning there? What time is it? Uh, yeah, we've just gone 4.30. Right. So we, we appreciate your dedication. Well, I guess now it's like just getting up early because <laughs> we're right, moving, yeah. <laughs> moving on late. And uh, I think your, your telescope, this is like, I think the first time we've had you join us where you've got pretty clear skies and you've got this terrific uh, Malincam. And uh, the views we've seen just already are just stunning. So I'm really looking forward to this tonight. Me too. Yeah. And uh, so, and I know you're going to be running back and forth to, for, to your telescope. So uh, now, what's your telescope? Uh, the telescope is a Celestron C8 uh, so, XL2. Same telescope. Yeah. Yeah. I, but the but I think the big difference here is that you've got this Malin cam, which I think people are going to see is is quite a terrific uh, way to to uh, record the the sky. So. Let's get rolling. Uh, so we've got uh, Gary Ganella. Hey, Gary. Hi, guys. You're down in Los Angeles, hey, and uh, I think it for me. It's some f for some reason you've got clear skies again. I know, isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. You had some terrible weather for a little while there. So normally you, we can. You're a rock. We can totally depend on you. So I know. I apologize. <laughs> you might be yeah. an island too. Yeah. It's, it's the moment my focuser is being uh, finicky. <laughs> but go ahead. All right, uh, so we got uh, Roy Salisbury, who is in, uh, where's Roy? There he is. He's in Las Vegas. There I am. Operating his remote uh, telescope from his uh, secret uh, secret bunker in, <laughs> I always get it wrong, it's in Arizona, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's about four um, miles down in the Arizona. Four miles down, yeah, yeah, built into an old uh, ICBM bunker. <laughs> Perfect. The nice clear view to the sky. Yeah. You've got like a big... You know, row of buttons you can press to <laughs> launch missiles or target telescopes. It's awesome. Uh, so we've got uh, we've got again in one view here. We got Nicole Gallucci and Scott Lewis. Yes, we're in meat space. We're in meat space. <laughs> I can't get rid of him. <laughs> so finally, if uh, you know, cold my, my ankles are chained to this desk. So much, please <laughs> save me. Like, call, call the police. Yeah. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> oh, good. Another TARDIS. Two TARDISes. Is that possible? Did you just cause a rip in the space time? I think Continue I have. Um, all right. And we've got Stuart Foreman who is setting up. So I don't know if he can even hear us. Right yeah, now. I, can, I can. Hello. I'll wave my flashlight here. Oh, there he is. All right. He's flashing us. Yeah. Evil Dr. Stuart Foreman. Awesome. All right. Well, Stuart, Stuart's still catching up. So we'll uh, hopefully we'll get a view from him shortly. And then we've got Dr. Thad Zabo. Good evening. How's it going? Pretty good. How about you, Fraser? So far, so good. I'm really looking forward to some of the uh, telescopes. It's, it's going to be a good night, I think. So I'm going to move <laughs> over. 
for... Are you in the same room with them, too? No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> not quite. Well, not I mean, quite. with the TARDIS, it may be. What a party it would be. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to go over to Andrew's view, and this is a sneak... The great thing about Andrew is, uh, among many things... Besides is, Andrew being awesome. Besides, besides his gen, you know, general awesomeness, is that he is living it. in the future. He is showing us the, the world of tomorrow. And in this case, it's what we're going to see in the night sky in about eight hours. So, four in the morning, uh, he's showing us a view of the Ring Nebula. <laughs> Crazy v- view, too. With color, with color, that's important. With color, yeah. Yeah, you're starting to see some blue background. I can see the sun just rising. Oh, <laughs> oh really? Is that going to start? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, okay. Turn away. To go, to the other, <laughs> go to the other side of the sky. But this is, this is phenomenal. This is just amazing. Yeah, I may switch to uh, the Dumbbell Nebula soon, just so I can get it before we lose the uh, the background. <laughs> now, in case right. you didn't know, the Ring Nebula is a, a planetary nebula, if you're watching this. So this is the, the outer layers of a star that have poofed off near the end of its lifetime. No, shut up. Not one that's actually got an explosion, but uh, one that... It went... <gasps> and not... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so what's left is actually being lit up by the white dwarf at the center, which used to be the star's core, or it's being excited by that. So if that was three feet shorter, that's what would be in the center. Um, and like, right, and that, that star that we see, though, is that that's not necessarily the actual star, right? That like, yeah. could be some star that's just behind right. it. Right. The, the white dwarf right. is only about magnitude 15. It's quite mm-hmm. faint. So it could just, yeah, it's probably just a superposition. And nice having the colors here because, I mean, the red is indicative of hydrogen. The uh, greenish blue in the middle is indicative of, oxi- of ionized oxygen. So... Um, mm-hmm. You'll note that's not the same green blue, right? That that green blue that's not the same blue as the sky, which is starting to come in around the nebula because of the sun coming up. Yeah. Um, you know, the sky is just scattering light, lower uh, frequency, or sorry, lower wavelength, higher frequency light gets scattered. So the sky is blue. This is actually oxygen that is absorbing electrons, and as they come back down to the lower levels, they give off this um, characteristic kind of greenish blue glow in the middle of the nebula there. Oh, it's a phenomenal view. So, oh, yeah, yeah. By all, so we'll we'll enjoy it for one second longer, and then I guess Andrew's going to head off and switch to the dumbbell nebula, which will be beautiful too. So, um, so Roy, what have you got as your view here? That is M eighty one, M eighty two. There you go. Um, now, um, in sort of in the comments, uh, Waigabo Kiljabob asks, "Is it possible to see M eighty one and M eighty two from in town? I've tried many times, but I don't seem to have any luck." Depends on how big the town is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how big the telescope is. Yeah. yeah. And how, Jinx, I mean, that's gorgeous. how dark the skies are, yeah. There's a lot of detail there. So, yeah. That is, that's really nice. Yeah, I mean, yeah. galaxies have such low surface brightness. Something like the Ring Nebula, I've seen that from L.A. easily with a telescope right. because yeah. it's compact. and the br- So... Yeah. Emission, yeah, the the emission yeah. lines and the the brightness is coming from such a small area of the sky. It, it can kind of cut through light pollution pretty well. Galaxies in general, there's no galaxy I can think of that shows up well from an urban area because mm-hmm. the light from them is spread out so much it just gets wiped out by um, by light pollution. Yeah. Um, now uh, Brian Simpson asks, who else was blown away by that recent pic of the Horsehead Nebula? Have you guys seen that picture yet? It was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was pretty bad. Up one? That was pretty badass. Yeah, the new one. It's just <laughs> unbelievable. Is it Hubble or is it? I think it's Spitzer. Infrared. It's an infrared. Spitzer. Okay. Spitzer or Herschel. Let me see who did it. It was infrared. Yeah, yeah. it's an infrared. I'm gonna grab the picture because it's just, it is amazing. 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 Look at that. You can see the dust lanes. Yeah. An M82. Wow, you can Oh, yeah, okay. That's so cool. Yeah, M- M81 and M82, they are, you know, they're relatively nearby, only about 12 million light years off, as opposed to, you know, most galaxies much, much, much farther away than that. Down the block. So, you know, yeah, essentially, you know, galactic speaking. <laughs> so here, I've just, I've just right screen there. shared this, this picture, so. Oof. Wow. Look at that. Wow. And that's something. That's near infrared, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, any of our infrared scopes that are up there at this point have run out of liquid helium, so, yeah. so they're right. going to be near infrared. Okay, it was done with Hubble. 
Okay. This was yeah. this was the what the twentieth, twenty thirtieth anniversary of Hubble, or whatever it was. Twenty something. Twenty something. It yeah. wouldn't be thirty, yes. <laughs> so. No, it's not all yeah. around there. Yeah, yeah, it's it's Hubble. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's something. Because Hubble can pick up near infrared. Yep. So, okay, I'm going back to, back to M82. M82. Look at the dust lane in M82. You, so this is a starburst galaxy, and what you can't see because it's an infrared is there's these plumes of, of gas being, being shot away from all these massive supernovae that have gone off in the center. But there's these really dark dust lanes from all that material, and you can see that dust lane clearly in, in, in the image that, um, that Roy has. Yeah, the galaxy at the bottom, that spiral, that, that's M81, also mm -hmm. known as Bode's Nebula, before they knew it was a galaxy, um, is gravitationally messing with, to be technical about it, um, M82, the galaxy at the top. Right. And if you look with radio waves, as yeah. as Nicole... As would, I am want to point out. <laughs> as Nicole would, would point out here, um, you can see the hydrogen between them. You can actually see the interaction from the 21-centimeter uh, line showing the, the hydrogen between the, the two galaxies. Here, it's just like, okay, well, what the heck's wrong with that galaxy at the top? It's tidal forces from the galaxy at the bottom. Yeah. Hmm. Causing the hydrogen the disk is so much bigger than the visible light disk, this is the stellar disk, though that's what's interacting yeah. and causing a mess. But it's it's definitely having its effect. That's a really good image. Wow. Yeah, that is beautifully Yeah, you were, you were concerned, Roy, but I think you're, you're going yeah. yeah. to nail it tonight. You'll be all right. That's uh, oh, 180 yeah. seconds. Wow. How long? Is that guided? No, none gun guided. Wow. Nice. What? Nice. <laughs> yeah, that's really phenomenal. He's so, at that huge bunker. He, you know, he doesn't need <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'm going to move to Gary's view here because I really like this galaxy. That's M51, right? Yay. Yes, this is the whirlpool. So I've imaged that in infrared. But you can really see that moon just destroying his view. You can still pull it out pretty well. I mean, yeah, there's definitely noise in the background. Yeah, no, it's in the foreground. I was about to. Right okay, here. I knew we were going to go there. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that. Yeah, there's noise all over. Yeah. But oh, wow. yeah, I was talking can... and I moved what? myself. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. You can, I, I know there's two minute exposure it. right now. That's one minute. Okay. But the spiral arms still show up really well. That extra galaxy that's interacting with the one spiral arm off to the left showing up very well. This is just such a great photographic tool. But it's yeah. blinking, yeah. Gary, it's yeah. blinking pretty pretty often here. It is? Yeah. 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 It's like almost epileptic Why the heck inducing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As our viewers froth at the mouth and seizure, yeah, seizure inducing. <laughs> yeah, I'm not no sure what's going on. He's doing that again. Yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, BTL743 wants to know who the rundown is. So we've got uh, Andrew Dumbleton, who is in uh, the UK and giving us the Dumbbell Nebula. Uh, we've got Gary Ganella. We've got uh, Mark Barrent. We've got Roy Salisbury. And we've got, shortly, we'll have Stuart Foreman. So, um, Working. Working. <laughs> um, and, and so Andrew, I can see the dumbbell starting to appear here now. Oh, yeah, it's but that uh, light pollution is really starting to catch up. It is. It's, uh, it's a lovely blue sky trying to starting to appear uh, in the east now, and it's it's almost wiped it out. So this is an 18 second exposure, um, but I can't. If I try to give it any more, it'll just lose it completely. I think. Yeah. yeah, the light pollution from the sun. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can't fight that. Say That's that a little tough Ian. to do. Yeah. So, I guess turn turn your back on the sun and look in the other direction. <laughs> yeah, I'll or just get the scope cold. up above the atmosphere, right? If you put the scope above the atmosphere, there's none of this scattering. Yeah. Yeah. That um, shouldn't be that tough. There's there's two private companies that'll do it for you now. Perfect. <laughs> so. That's good. So, uh, are there some? You said you wanted to look at some uh, some globular clusters, right? Yeah, I'll move on to some star clusters because I think that's all I'll be able to grab now. Okay. Well, I'm just trying to think if that's sort of off to the east for you. What's what's off to your western sky right now? Probably the stuff uh, that's just M13 rising for us now. Uh, it's still off there. Yeah, M13 would be pretty high up for you. It'd be nearly zenith, wouldn't it? Almost. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. That's Zabo can... with the star map in his head. <laughs> <laughs> and, keep, and keep in mind, he's translating eight hours ahead, so that's yep. not bad at all. 
Um, okay, like I so said, I'm already planning my summer, so you know, yeah, these where the stars are going to be in three months is yeah, that's that's pretty well in my brain. Yeah. Uh, Roy, uh, Roy, you've got another galaxy for us. That is M one hundred one. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I'm, gonna, I'm doing a brightness. I'm doing a five minute image right now. This is 180 seconds as well, but it's. Yeah. I can't believe how rock solid that mount is for you. That is just terrific. Yeah, and those stars got... are points. I mean, there is no trail. Yeah. I mean, I'm, watch. I'm going to jinx it now or something. But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but right you got a... there's <laughs> trails in there, but they happen to be satellites. Yeah, there's yeah. a satellite running there. <laughs> They're aliens. <laughs> Uh, Mark, have you got? To, how's your moon doing? Are you moving to something else? Um, I was trying to move over to Saturn, but apparently, uh, still, uh, I'm trying something new with a Stellarium plug-in that allows me to control my mount and everything, and it's not a hundred percent perfect here. So I'm, I'm uh, playing with it, trying to get. I'm trying to see if I can get Saturn for you guys too. Well, the I mean. In a perfect world, that would be amazing, right? You just click around on Stellarium, and your telescope will just move to different objects. Yeah, but that'd just be too easy, wouldn't it? That would be too easy, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So instead, you'll just sort of thrash around with software, and it won't work for you. Exactly. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, so I just want to let you people know who's watching that we're glad to take your requests and glad to uh, to sort of answer your questions about... Uh, amateur astronomy, about astrophotography, and just about uh, space and astronomy in general. So there's a bunch of ways you can do that. If you're watching this on uh, Google+, Plus, either on the event page, you can make a comment there. If you're watching this somewhere in, you know, I guess my post showing up in your stream, uh, you can make the comment there. And the, the safest place is to make a comment over on YouTube. So if you're watching this video anywhere, just click to view it on YouTube, and there you'll see the comments. You can make a, a post there. Um, and then also, uh, if you're watching this embedded, you can also use Twitter if you, if that's what you like. Just use the hashtag Star Party in, in all those locations. If, if you have to, we'll check Twitter. We know as well. how you feel about Twitter, Razor. Okay. Uh, I, I respect Twitter just fine. Okay, that's true. You do not enjoy it. I, I, um, do, I, do, I, is, I don't have that, to like it. Um, Dad, I, is M101 one of those bulchless spirals that has like a. Uh, doesn't have a supermassive black hole, or it has one that's like really small for its class. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure. It's it's definitely you know on the, the whole scale of S A to S. Like a point. Yeah, it's it's not um, it's not a very tightly wound spiral. Mm -hmm. I think it's like an S C or an S D. Um, S S A S are very tightly wound. S C S D the the arms are are pretty loose. Um, yeah, I don't know too much about the the. Supermassive black hole in the middle. I mean, it's. I feel like that was one of those ones that was on the borderline because it doesn't quite have a bulge, like a proper galaxy bulge. I'm surprised no one is giggling right now. <laughs> <laughs> because we already recorded a pilot episode about the bulge of galaxies. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> we did. That. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna move to Andrew's view here because it's awesome. Bulge. Okay. Look at that. Ooh. Yeah, we've got a, a slightly blue M13. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and so what's M13? So this is a globular cluster. This is one of the oldest objects that you can possibly look at in the sky. These stars will have formed uh, even before the Milky Way would have formed. They're um, part of a, a group of stars. There's about 100 globular clusters or so that orbit around the Milky Way out in the, the halo of our galaxy. And this is about the second largest one in the sky. The largest one would have to have a southern hemisphere astronomer to, to look at for us. Mm -hmm. um, but M13 is, is the best for the northern hemisphere. About 500,000 to a million stars in that view right there. Can you see... It would be, like, if you've got really dark skies, can you see there's, like, a little blurry spot in the sky with your yes. unaided eye? Yeah. Yes, this is naked eye if you know where to look. It's on so the... I've been told I've never caught it. And my eyes are just not <laughs> that good. It's, you, you can see it um, on... It, well, it's in Hercules. It's in the chest yeah. of Hercules, kind of halfway up and down the right-hand side, I guess, from my perspective, of Hercules. Right, the, the western side of, yeah, yeah. of uh, the keystone in Hercules. Yeah. So. And I've got dark enough skies that I can see it. For most most of the places that I'll shoot from, yeah, it's naked eye for me. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, Michael Yobin says that we are rich tonight. We are. We have so many yeah. telescopes. It's a beautiful night tonight. I'm really I'm really excited. Um, yeah. Although we're gonna lose uh, this 
Great view right from Andrew. So Andrew, keep moving. Keep keep heading heading <laughs> west. I will. We'll Run from nice the to sun. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a question from, was it Sean Kim Style, about mm -hmm. uh, are we able to get the Omega Centauri globular cluster? Uh, no, we don't have anybody far enough south. So mm -hmm. I know I've, I've seen it over the Pacific um, from the one place I shoot. I'm, one of my goals this summer is to try to image it, um, but that's tricky, tricky timing because it really only spends about an hour to 90 minutes in the, the right place above the horizon to image. So And a lot of yeah. atmosphere going through right yeah a lot of atmosphere and the thing is I'm in I'm in LA so I'm at 34 degrees north latitude you go much farther north than here it's just not possible to get so yeah um, Omega Sen is also thought to be a dwarf galaxy in its own right or at least the core of dwarf galaxy in its own right yeah we're talking more than a million close to two million stars for Omega yeah. Sen so it's one of these things that's gotten nommed on by the the Milky Way some and it's probably stripped away some stars so but the like like um, like Nicole was saying, that the the core of the galaxy is bound together mm -hmm. tightly enough by gravity that, ah, thirteen and a half billion years later, it's still out there. So. And I guess yeah, the the, the division between galaxy and globular cluster is pretty much a continuum, right? Right. So where, where, where does <laughs> where does globular cluster end and dwarf galaxy begin? I, I don't know if there is somewhere a, around Omega Sen. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. In the vicinity of. So yeah. <laughs> Um, BTL743 says, whoever's speaking should narrate an astronomy show on BBC. So that's you, Thad. You should narrate an astronomy show on BBC. Yes. So, well, unless it was Andrew, right? I mean, because Andrew and is from the UK. Yeah. Oh, Andrew could do it too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, both of you could do one Where's together. Where's Mark? There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Marka, look at Mark. Mark. Um, uh, so, uh, Mark, we've got your Saturn here. Yes, we do. It's through a tree, so if it uh, fades in and out, it, you know why? Ooh. In green. In beautiful blue. Arboreally occulted. <laughs> now, have you already, is this already sort of maximized it? Yeah, this is embiggened. I even took the focal reducer off, so this is as embiggened as I can get right now. Without, like, a Barlow. Yeah. So, Mark, where, whereabouts are you? East, east coast, center of the uh, country? Right, right smack dab in the middle, Chicago. Okay. okay. So Saturn's about... What, it's about pretty, 25, it's 30 low. degrees up for you? Yeah, it's pretty low. Okay. Dad, and so people I want to, come help to with the see... Star Parties in Edwardsville. <laughs> <laughs> you know the night sky so well. Uh, if people want to see I can Saturn, virtually. I think people don't realize that you can uh, that you can actually see Saturn with your own eyeballs. Like, yeah. Yeah, so the thing for trying to find it in the sky, look for the Big Dipper. There's the handle of the Big Dipper. It makes a curve. I don't know if can I curve my finger enough to show this. Okay, so there's the curve of the handle of the Big Dipper. You follow the arc to a bright star called Arcturus, and then you speed on to a bright blue-white star called Spica. Saturn will be trailing behind Spica as they cross the sky. So if you see the bright blue-white star is Spica, um, looking more to the east from that you would see a kind of cream color about the same brightness as Spica that's and glowing steadily because it's a planet not a star that would be Saturn comes up around 830 yeah it's a, it's a yeah it's a little yellowish I mean I completely lucked out the first time I saw Saturn when I was like a teenager had a, my, my telescope and there was that this sort of yellowish star and I thought ah, maybe that's a planet and I took a look at it and yeah indeed it was Saturn and it has ears that's some good serendipity there yeah. Um, let's see. PTL uh, oh, is mentioning that that Thad does this demonstration every star party. No, that's not true. You've only been doing this demonstration for about three of them, right? Which, which demo? The the, the arc to the, Arcturus. The, the, the twisting, yeah, speeding yeah. on and. Well, I mean, this is the right time of year for Arcturus it. And, the, yeah. The what are you kids doing over there in that window? But, but this is this is the right time of year for the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper hangs high overhead for the northern hemisphere around midnight at this time of year. This is great time of year for looking for galaxies, of which there are many in the Big Dipper. Um, and yeah, so Saturn, uh, as of two weeks from now, will be at opposition, meaning it will be up all night long. So yeah, there's a reason for me to do this demo now, because yeah. it's the right time of year for it. If you come back in the fall, I won't do this demo, because the Big Dipper will be right on the horizon for most of the night. So... 
Um, okay, and Appleton, yeah, a couple of questions. In the comments is asking uh, what size scope we're looking at Saturn with, and it's an mm -hmm. eight-inch scope. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, did we do a rundown of equipment? I think yep. a couple of people yeah, have been asking. Did. Yep. Did I yep. miss it? We did. We can do it again. Andrew Dumbleton has a C8 Celestron. Gary Ganella has a 12, 14-inch 14 14 Celestron. Mark Barron has a C8 as well. Roy Salisbury, what do you have, Roy? 106-millimeter uh, refractor. Refractor. And Stuart Foreman has a 130-millimeter refractor? 100, 100, yeah, 140. 140, don't, okay. Don't short, don't short me the 10 centimeters. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, don't short you. 10 yeah. centimeters, that would be, yeah, a, a, be quite shorting. Uh, 10, um, mil, 10 millimeters. That's 10 right. millimeters, yeah. <laughs> so, Stuart, you, you've joined us now, and I, I believe did. we've got the, what, the blue snowball? Uh, no, but it looks like it, based on the resolution. This is the Eskimo Nebula. Um, uh, oh, that's got to be pretty low. It's well, no, it's actually not. Uh, oh, that's right. You're West Coast. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yes, it's not too bad. It's um, but it's it kind of looks like the blue snowball. I had to. It's about the same size, and I had to crop it quite severely to to actually see it. But um, uh, I'll let Thad explain what this yes, is. What is it? Explain. Eskimo. <laughs> Eskimo. Of all the words. <laughs> underlined in this copy of, oh, anyway, sorry, Heather's <laughs> reference. Um, so, I mean, it's a planetary nebula. We were looking at the Ring Nebula before and the Dumbbell Nebula. This is, again, a, a planetary, just like those. So, again, gentle death to the star, tens of thousands of years for the gas to pool off of the star into space, as opposed to your supernova. Can you guys demonstrate the supernova for me instead? <laughs> all right, all right, so, okay. <laughs> You gotta collapse first. You go boom. There we go. <laughs> My boyfriend's trying to sleep. I should stop. <laughs> I love you, Tim. <laughs> So, yeah, so supernova, I mean, you're talking about an explosion that you can watch over the span of a few years. So for, for um, from an astronomical term, that is an extremely short time span. But here we go. We're looking at blue. The blue, again, coming from ionized oxygen. Um, the white dwarf is going to be very rich in carbon and oxygen, so some of this oxygen is leaked off from it, from the, the area of the star surrounding the white dwarf. You get this blue glow. That's cool. You're awesome. I love planetary nebulae. I'm going to go back to Gary's view. This is M101, and I think Roy's on the same one. Yeah, oh. I'm stuck on it. I can't get it off of this image. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh -oh. I'm That's sorry I said your scope was working well, Roy. Yeah, because yeah. I took a five-minute one. I was going to show it, and now I can't get it off of this two-minute one. Hmm. Where are you sharing it from the remote computer? No, this is local. This is just screen sharing off of a, a JPEG oh, okay. image. All right. And it won't change. Hmm. Actually, I can't even switch over to Thad or Stuart. It's just a white background. So you might want to Google Pluses. Yeah, you might want to leave and then come back. Yeah, go, I'll be back. Go away and come back. Yeah, go time. away, Roy. Yeah, <laughs> think about what go you've away done. And come back another time. All right, I'm gonna move to Andrew with that with his brightening sky. <laughs> yeah, I'm nearly lost it. <laughs> I think this will be the last one. Yeah. But it's kind of neat. I mean, we're kind of we're watching the sunrise from the UK. Yeah, yeah. I know. And that's essentially what, what we're yeah. doing here with this. Can this. can you, in the end, point uh, your telescope at the sun? <laughs> no, <laughs> not with the filter on it. <laughs> no, no. On okay. a future star party, maybe. Just, just yeah. reduce the exposure <laughs> to one second. Yeah. Okay. And just keep your, <laughs> keep, you know, and, and like keep your eye away from the beam of light that burns out a hole at the back of the camera. We haven't done a, a sun in a star party in a while, have we? No, no we, no, we, we, we miss our Australian or friends. Or yeah. We'll, we'll handle that for us. Yeah. Uh, I mean, his daily shot of the sun is mm. something to behold. So, yeah, yeah. if you, if yeah. you want to follow for your, for your daily shot of the sun, follow Paul Stewart yeah. on, uh, <laughs> on Twitter or on um, Google Plus. On, uh, on Google Plus. So, it, Roy, is this, did this work? Is this your five minute view yeah. now? That's the five minute M101. That is lovely. Ooh. Look at that. Whoa. And so now, I, yeah, I have to go look up this black hole question from yeah. the, the center I tried, of this. I tried briefly and didn't find anything can, on it. I think I, I, think I, I made it big. In. You, can, you can make it bigger? All right. Ooh. I don't see a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> right? Funny, neither so am I. So it's not there. You can't see it, so it's not there. Yep. Was it, I don't, oh, there's there no dark matter out there either. Stop. Some nice star clouds in the outer arms, though. Right? So star clusters.
lobsters that you know we would see oh, yeah. in our sky. Um, and you can see really well here. If, um, my guess is we also probably have some emission nebulae out there too. That's part of the reason for the, the, the bright glow. Are you shooting, Roy? Are you short shooting hydrogen alpha? No, this is luminance. Luminance. Okay. So it's well, I guess far enough I mean, away I from the moon that I, think, I don't I really think it'd be hit it. Clumpier if it was H alpha. Well, I know Gary's shooting H alpha. Yes. Right? So yeah. so we can match up. We can try and match up some of these clumps, and if there's a region of hydrogen that's being lit up by one of these massive O class stars, it will glow quite brightly in um, in Gary's view. And I, I think uh, if I can switch back and forth here between the two of them. Yeah, I think with what I can compare between the two of them, some of those outer regions, the, the far reaches of the arms, you can see some very nice emission nebulae in, in, uh, yeah. that show up even brighter in Gary's view because he's selecting for them. Yeah. And a satellite. Uh, you're, you're, so satellite. Picky, Gary. you're so picky. Yeah. I don't want this wavelength. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that wavelength. <laughs> it's not nice. Yeah. It looks like we got another galaxy over to the right side of the frame for yeah. For Gary's view here. Oh yeah, Gary's view. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure what that is. NGC something or other. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah according to a. Um... According to hmm. No, according to a paper, but this is from 2007. It's one of those giant disks that doesn't have a black hole, but that doesn't mean they haven't found something since 2007. Yeah, M one oh one is fairly yeah. nearby. It's less it's about eighteen million light years off, if I remember correctly. No, it should be pretty straightforward yeah. to try getting some uh spectra of stars nearby that are look for a redshift or blue shift. But again, its plane is like it's it's almost face on to us. So if you're trying to make those kind of measurements, yeah, you want something where some stars are coming at you and some stars are yeah. going away. If it's flat like that, it's gonna be tough to do those spectroscopic measurements for yeah. um, for mm -hmm. motion like that. Now, Andrew, you put up an image here, but I'm thinking this isn't live. No, this this is breaking the rules. So this is too. Yeah, we got in his TARDIS. Went back in time. Yeah, went back in time. Go. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wobbly, 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 wobbly. Yeah, I went on a, an astronomy holiday last week and uh, in the UK in Devon, and this was uh, something I caught with the Malincam just to show you the, uh, the type of thing it can capture from galaxies. So this is M M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Wow. Hey. And how long of an exposure is that? Uh, I think this was two minutes. The one with, real advantage, the huge yeah. advantage the Malincamps have is that they work similar to the way the human eye does. And that if you use a typical CCD camera, it's a bin and you fill it up with photons and the more photons that you put in, the brighter it gets. The way the human eye works, it says, okay, well, this many photons look this bright. This many times more photons looks at the next brightness level. And this many times more photons looks at the next brightness level. And so the way the eye tends to process information allows for a much wider range of brightnesses. The Malincam is designed similarly in that um, it's, it's not purely logarithmic like the eye, whereas it's multiple times of photons, but it's, it's much closer to that than your typical CCD camera. So you can get a huge range of brightness levels um, even with one shot. Like I've seen plenty of times Malincams have gotten the trapezium, the four stars at the middle of the Orion Nebula, as well as the, the outer edges. A typical CCD blows out the middle so that you can't see anything other than this bright nebulosity. And then you get the faint outer edges. Or you can see the four stars and you don't get the, the outer edges of the nebula. Malincams are, are well designed to be able to get both. And Mark, uh, what are we seeing here? Uh, I moved over to Spica since Dad was talking about it as a way to find oh, nice. Jupiter. Yeah. Oh, neat. Okay. So if you want the color, seeing... that is a good representation of the color, even with the light pollution filter in there. And you're so... actually seeing the effects of the atmosphere in real time yes. as well. Yeah, so it's bright seeing... enough where I can just do video of it instead of yeah. trying to take like minute exposures. But if you do video of it and then do screen captures fast enough, you can actually do something called speckle interferometry. Or something I did in grad school as a I lab. Spell that. <laughs> speckle interferometry. We we I know we used a very fast video camera for that, um, and you can use that to uh, measure the actual size of the disk of the star using the the different you know pockets of air as it's moving around um, as the interferometer itself. I don't remember all the details, but <laughs> it's used video great. and it was astronomy. Yeah. Used video, used a twenty-six inch telescope, and we were up all night. <laughs> <laughs> As one would. As one yeah. would be. 
But yeah, this is the brightest star in Virgo, and it is the closest star to us that can go um, supernova at 400 light years off. It's not near that point in its life. It's still on the main sequence, but it is the the closest star to us in space that can go blow up as a type 2 supernova. Well, tell it to hurry up. Kaboom. I know. Wait, Betel guy, Antares, come on. Yeah. Come on already. Yeah. yeah, Ada Karina, come on already. Explode. Yeah. Well, that's Southern Hemisphere. We won't be able to see that one. So. Stuart, oh, what do we got here? This is M35 with that little NGC cluster that I can never remember the name of. Off, to the, off to the lower left. Um, this is a two-minute exposure. It's relatively low in the sky, and I'm fighting a street light, light pollution in the moon. Um which is part of my technical problems tonight, but uh, I was able to, I was, I was trying to bring out that smaller little cluster to the lower left. It was like my third try at it. You got yeah. it. You, you got, got it. it. Yeah, no, it's good. It's great. I mean, you've definitely got some, uh, something going on in, in the, on the left here, the purpley, and then it's kind of greeny over on the right, but still, yeah. it's, it, the stars look great. Yeah, this is one of the many open clusters that you can see in the plane of the Milky Way. It's these youngish grouping of, of stars that probably formed all from the same cloud around the same time and are still gravitationally bound as they're moving without, throughout the Milky Way. Um, but they can um, be falling apart. What's interesting about clusters is that you can find, by looking at all these stars that were formed at the same time, uh, you can use uh, what we know about stellar astrophysics to get the age of these clusters. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move to Gary's view because it's awesome. It is because M I want to. Ooh. M104, Earth. the Sombrero Galaxy. Earth. That's yes. amazing. Earth. <laughs> and this, this galaxy, when I um, was first kind of presenting it to students, I would say, well, there's a dust lane in it, so it's a spiral. Spiral galaxies have gas and dust. Ellipticals tend not to. Uh, However, they've, they've uh, since, yeah, I know, it's, it's gotten a little bit... Uh, you can't say red and dead anymore. Well, for the most part, yes, you can, the except most for, part. again, but you, yeah, this, well, this was part of my, my, my dissertation thesis, too, is that mm. you, you get some of these brightest cluster galaxies that are still forming uh, stars because of gas collapsing into them. But the sombrero, um, so it does have this, this ring of dust around the edge, and, and in certain views, it definitely looks like spiral structure. But the, the way that the stars are organized around the middle, I mean, you can see this kind of bright center to the middle, but a longer exposure, like, or say with the Hubble telescope, you can see this very large structure of older stars that extend almost all the way out to where the, uh, the, the ring is around the outside. And so they're thinking, well, it's kind of hybrid between elliptical in the center, and then you still have this ring that looks um, spiral on the outside. So this one's still, this is a little bit of a mystery, trying to figure out exactly what's going on with the Sombrero galaxy. Um, what? Has Roy changed? No, we're all... No new no, stuff. I'm, I'm, it's a race. I'm, you're letting us down, guys. I'm I'm gonna gonna guys. We're just going to gaze at Spica. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I just moved it over to Arcturus, so you're looking at Arcturus. Oh, we're looking at Arcturus now. Completely oh. different looking from Spica. <laughs> <laughs> well, that light pollution filter will really uh, yeah, that's... add some similarity here. Arcturus, when you look at it in the sky, though, is distinctly orange. It's a, it's a red giant star, not a red supergiant, but a red giant star similar to what our sun will look like, give it about five and a half billion years. Now you're looking, this thing's blue. Are you, you know, are you drunk on Pisco Sours? Why are you thinking this thing is, why are you telling me this thing's orange? orange. <laughs> it, <yeah. laughs> and I wish, I wish I had some Pisco Sour. That's just I awesome need to stuff. order more Pisco online now that I'm out, so. But, but anyway, yeah, if, you, if, you're, if you're looking with your own eyes and, and you can pick up these colors, yeah, then you can tell that Arcturus is a, an orange star. It's the third brightest star in the sky. Um, so it's a good target for video. And again, you follow, there we go again, right? The, the handle of the Big Dipper, you arc to Arcturus. Well, here's, here's video of Arcturus. It's the bottom of booties, right? Booties, yeah, yeah. Booties, yes. I know. It looks like so. <laughs> it, it's in the constellation of Fat Bottom Girls. <laughs> and it probably would make a lot of around. <laughs> Not even going to give it a second. Moving right along. I like big stars and I cannot lie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
You're welcome, you Internet. Are welcome you done? Are you people done? No. Nope. I think we're done. <laughs> no. Should we just wait? We wait. <laughs> wait for it. Because <laughs> um, I've moved on to what Stuart's got. Um, see if you can guess. <laughs> this is such a tor- horrible image. See if you can guess what this is. Is this the Crab Nebula? Is yeah, crab? It's very it good. is the Crab. Wow. It is the Crab Nebula. It is really low in the sky. It's like right above my garage and um, right just to the right of the street light. And it's, but I was able to pull a little bit out of it. Yeah. Um, you know, so you can see you can see it as a definite smudge. And the nice thing about this particular image is this is pretty much exactly how, what it would look like if you're looking through an eyepiece. Yeah, you know, except for the reddish color. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, but it's it doesn't look a lot more defined than this. Obviously, you know, I have like a a two hour exposure of this is much better. But this is you know a two minute exposure that. Um, uh, you're a, you're able to see, yeah, it's a definite smudge with a little bit of structure in it. Yeah, I think it's time for Nicole and Scott's uh, Type Two Supernova demo again here. <laughs> okay, okay. So it's or a flocculent over. cluster. <laughs> you have you have the big star massive, and then it collapses. <laughs> and that's uh, what happened with this about 7,500 years ago. Yep, yep. So, <laughs> oh. Nicely done. It's big yeah. explosions. But it's a collapse. It's a core collapse supernova because it collapses down and then rebounds. And that's the energy that pushes all that material out there. Uh, Tina Washir asks, uh, how often is this done live? I'd love to catch it again. So, Tina, we do this show every Sunday night when it gets dark on the West Coast. So right, right now, in as we're nearing summer, that means it's 8.30 is when we have to start, which is when it gets dark. At the sort of you know June twenty first, we're as late as ten o'clock when we start. But in the winter time, in the dead of winter, we start at five o'clock at uh, night, so it's eight o'clock Eastern. So and everybody just write your congressman and tell them get rid of daylight savings. Daylight savings time and yes. also uh, remove the tilt of the Earth. Yes. <laughs> Right. <laughs> the moon would be nice too. And, and, and destroy the moon. I think if we could, or launch our space telescope, and then we can just, uh, you know, we don't need any of any of this ground-based stuff. Launch a big tarp to cover over the moon. <laughs> the big tarp. It's just a the really dawn of time. Tarp. Man has wanted to destroy the moon. But of course, this is the problem, right? If you get a tarp to cover the moon, the moon is already really non-reflective. So what material would you make the tarp out of that's even less reflective than the moon? That's hard to come up with. The moon yeah, is comets already... are the darkest things in the solar system. And... All right, well, let's just go catch a whole bunch of those. we got the oh. asteroid caption, capture mission. Let's assess them to change it to comet capture and just well, black right them into the moon. Tens well, of thousands of them. Didn't they create a black hole in that uh, Large Hadron collide, collide? Just, like, throw it in there and just... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I moved on to Roy's view now, and I, I am at a loss. What is it, Roy? That is M94. What is that? 94 or 64? (laughs) I'm thinking 64. That's the Black Eye Galaxy, isn't it? Yeah, let me make sure. Maybe I I was wrong. Wait, 63. 64 is the Sunflower, 63 is the Black Eye. So M63. Uh, Alan Eggleston asks, is there some controversy whether galaxies start to spiral and become elliptical? It couldn't the sombrero be somewhere in between... In there's not a controversy. We just no. accept that <laughs> there's a More there's correct. a disky stage in between. But generally, what happens if you have spirals f- merged together, that they lose their rotational characteristics. The pressure from the collision forces out the gas and dust, and what you end up with at the end, uh, when the collision settles down, is an elliptical. So ellipticals come from collisions between spirals, or an elliptical can just go eat other galaxies. It's called galactic cannibalism, and make a bigger and bigger elliptical. <laughs> but yeah, this is the uh, this is called the Black Eye Galaxy. In, yeah, it's uh, really Roy's distinct. Here. This sort of blob in the middle. And this is in Canis Venatici, if I remember correctly, same as uh, same as the the let's see, it's the Whirlpool Canis Venatici. I think it is. Uh, okay, so what is causing that? I can't tell from this picture. Is that that doesn't look like a dust lane? It's it a, is a dust lane. It's it is a dust lane. It's dust lane. Yeah, Hubble. There was a recent Hubble shot of this, and the, yeah, that dust lane is just huge and lopsided, right? I mean, it's just yeah, on that's one side of the that's just weird. So, but also and you know, extremely out of focus. <laughs> so, it looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, yeah. Really, that's, that's too much. Don't beat yourself up. It's 
small galaxy. It's 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 really hard to get much more detail yeah, than this. But the one fact one. that 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 dust shows up that well, no, this this is a good job. Don't don't you like you said? Don't beat yourself up over this. This is good. <laughs> don't give yourself a you black should, eye. Your picture is bad. Your galaxy. Feel bad, Roy. <laughs> yeah. I'll yeah. For you. Your picture is bad. I'm not even looking feel. at the galaxy. You had one job, Roy. Huge. <laughs> you had one job. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, poor Sam. <laughs> All right. I move to Gary's view, and I am again at a loss. It is M99, the pinwheel. Okay. And you can see it's getting a little close to the moon. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I'm watching yes. out on the right side. This is in Virgo, and the moon is... Oh, wait, I don't have the app on me. Oh, I don't have my phone. Fraser. Yes. Phases the moon app. What constellation is the moon in tonight? I'm going to guess tonight? it's Leo, Leo near Virgo. It's in Virgo. Okay, so it's right near where M99 is in the sky. So, yes, there's a reason for all that bright Virgo. glow. People Over. give us a hard time. I was going to move to our app here. So people give us a hard time because we put the constellation... And like we don't want any of that astrology nonsense, and like I agree, we don't want any of that astrology nonsense. These are constellations, and this is where the moon is. We actually use these when we're yeah. giving yeah. sky tours and so getting is, our bearings. So this is the view of the moon tonight, yeah. And so it's not. I mean, you don't see Persephone Ooh. chained up in the sky or getting ready to be thrown into Hades for six months or whatever. But the stories are interesting. The stories are interesting. Yeah. The stories are interesting. What we're talking about is much more boring than that. <laughs> it's it's take the sky, draw a line around a bunch of stars. If stars fall inside that line, it's part of that constellation. So the moon tonight falls inside that line. It's in the constellation Virgo. Give it a couple nights. It'll be in Libra, and then Scorpius, then Ophiuchus. Ah, not Sagittarius, right? In Ophiuchus, then Sagittarius. So yes, but there's you know we we mark boundaries, these artificial boundaries on the sky, just to be able to say, oh yeah, this star is inside inside this boundary, yeah. it's part of this constellation. Did you remove your, your uh, light pollution filter or figure something out, Mark? I removed it because everybody was complaining about how oh, 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 no. oh, okay. to Still, this is a no. terrific view of, this is, I'm guessing, the northern limb of the moon. I think that's Plato down in the lower uh, lower left corner. I believe that's... Hold Plato. on, let me check Fraser's uh, Phases of the Moon app. It tells, <laughs> tells you exactly what it was. Oh. We're going to sell a lot of copies tonight. And so that's Available on Android and iOS. Okay. Phases of the Moon. 99 uh, yeah. cents. Pretty sure that's the Plato is the large lava-filled crater in the lower left of our yeah. view. Mari, Mari Fragoris cuts across the... Uh, the left side of the view. Oh, we're seeing we that smooth area there. The northern limb of the moon. Is that uh, what we're looking at? Clavius. Clavius is on the south side, so this would be maybe like J. Herschel. Hmm. So okay, so yeah, so where we're looking from the big view here oh, is we were over far here. over to the left, right? Or to the right? Mm. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, far over to the right. That oh, that big yeah. crater. Plato. The, yep, that's Plato. And Mar, and then right beside it is Mar. Frigoris. Yep. And then and just... Aristoteles. Aristoteles. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Is there a biggest dickus? <laughs> I don't know if that works. <laughs> I love my. <laughs> I don't know if that works here. Get the name there. It's too close. So we try. It's upside Thank down. You, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Luis Wadawick. <laughs> There's Copernicus in the middle of the moon. Uh, so if we're talking about biggest dickest, then there's Copernicus there, right? So and Kepler would be just uh, just east of that. Which is this one you just on zoomed in on? <laughs> this is Copernicus. Uh, that's yeah, Copernicus, Copernicus, yeah. This is Copernicus, yes. Hold on, I'm just gonna I'm gonna mute Nicole and Scott. There we go. They can just go off now to their own little world. <laughs> <laughs> see them when they're when they're back. But, yeah, I mean, this this you can see some of these these little peaks in the middle of Copernicus Crater. So what happens when you you get an asteroid slamming into the moon? <coughs> the middle rebounds a bit. 
So it's kind of if you watch a slow motion bit with a drop of water, that yeah. the water goes in, the ripples go out, and then the middle bounces back up. Well, rock will behave like a fluid if you have this much energy pumped into it. And so the middle of this crater has jumped back up a little bit from when the asteroid hit. You can actually see these little mountainous, these, these two little peaks in the middle of Copernicus Crater. And you can really, I mean, this is a fairly fresh crater, isn't it? You can see all this, these rays coming out from it. I'm not sure of the age, um, but I'm going to guess less than a billion years old. Maybe. Yeah, young. Just a baby. So, and the walls yeah. of slump, you can see the walls have slumped, too, mm -hmm. that after the sh you know the shock wave goes out, that typically, if you look, for instance, at the crater over to the uh, right from it, that the walls are quite sharp on that one. But for Copernicus, they've actually kind of slumped in, so you get this kind of fuzzy transition from the crater floor out to the, the rest of the moon, out to Oceanus Prosolarum around it. Oh, and did Stuart move to the moon as well? I gave in to the inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you've also got your uh, light pollution filter I on, do don't you? I have a light pollution filter. I tried to do a quick color correction. It didn't work too well. Really it, crisp, though. It, instead yeah, of you're farting with crisp. it. Yeah. So um, I'm trying to do another one and make it less blue for Fraser because I know he whines about that. Yeah, he does. I know. I'm, I'm relentless. You're so demanding. <laughs> so Fraser demanding. I know. Oh, oh that's just okay. gorgeous. Since you were busy plugging the Moon app, I'm also going to plug Moon Mappers, since we're talking a lot about craters and crater formation. Uh, it's the oldest citizen science project going on at CosmoQuest. I, I don't know how many craters we've marked. Well over a million well, now. The um, so first science results are coming out soon. I keep saying that, but you know, the review process, it takes a while. Um, so come join us at CosmoQuest on Moon Mappers and help do the science and look at these interesting craters and help identify them. So Mark, that, just, this is just terrific, Mark. This is just amazing. Like the, yeah. the view is so cl clear. Your just focus is right on. Slide a little bit to the east and south and show people Cenus Iridum. So it's this kind of mountain ridge around, um, let's see, it would be more to the east of, uh, along Mari Fragoris there. It looks kind of like a bite taken out of one portion of, of Mari Imbrium. Um, but the, the mountains were in a, a good phase where the angle of the sunlight there is, is nice and low. Yeah. So the mountains from that region tend to stand out pretty well. So if you slew back to the east and the south just a little bit, you'll pick it up. East. I know, because it's that easy to do. I understand. Yeah, running a telescope, it's like... Well, oh, he's, yeah, let me he's clicking on the screen, I think he can... Yeah, I'm just zooming in and out, so... Yeah. Okay. Um, which, which way do you... Uh, I'm not sure which way is south on my. Which way on the sure. image? Is south so, away from the Terminator? Toward the Terminator. Toward toward the sorry, Terminator. east east is toward the Terminator, and then south. South is to the left on your image. Okay, so you want to look like right about here, or do you want to go more towards the? Uh... More toward the Terminator, just a little bit. No, no, no I do what, have to. What are we looking yeah. for? Cenus, Cenus Iridum. It's, it's right off the top of my view. I'd have to go re uh, move my telescope. Okay, sorry, bit. I didn't mean um, to. I've got a, I've got a, I fixed my color. Uh, maybe we can see it. Yeah, so, it's... let's see. So if you go from Plato Crater on the the left edge, it's the the one very round. Oh, this is. Oh, there, just there it sick. is. Yeah, you had it. There, there, there it is. Perfect. Okay. So again, this nice little mountain range at the end of edge of. Um, Mari, Mari Imbrium, and so you can see these lava flows that have filled in areas of the moon about three, three and a half billion, three, three to three and a half billion years ago, and then this this very sharp mountain range around the edge of it there. So I know this is one my students will often sketch. You've got some nice mountains at, kind of at the edges, kind of the you know the ends of the smile there. Um, so I forget exactly what those their promontories is what they're they're typically called with um, with when they're labeled. But you know, just if you're if you're looking at the moon through a telescope, this is one of those features that stands out really well when it's at this phase. That's just an amazingly crisp view of the moon, though. This is just yeah. mind bending. <clears throat> yeah, this, a is great, just, uh, this is just a four hundred four hundredth of a second exposure. Um, nice. So. Did uh, Corey? sort of sent me a link on, on Friday. Corey Schmitz, who sometimes joins us, uh, that someone had taken a, a view of the moon and done it at a resolution of about, I think, 5,000 by 7,000, and then had made it so you could zoom in to any part. And so you could see the whole moon and then zoom right down to, like, this kind of 
this kind of resolution and then back out again. It just looked amazing. That's some good programming too, to be able to have a, an app or, or a page, which allows you to do that smoothly. Yeah. So. I think I'll see if I can find it actually. I bet I could screen share it while we while we talk. I'm going to move on to Gary's view. What's Gary got? Getting the comments here. Yeah. Well, I'll open it up. Sorry. Galaxy. Sorry, I was muted. The dogs oh, okay. parking outside. <clears throat> this is M90. M90. Okay, so another one part of the Virgo cluster. So again, the moon is hanging out nearby. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, this time of year is not the time for my telescope. All the big things in the sky have either gotten gone down or not come up yet. Mm. Yeah, it's it's galaxy season for uh, yeah. the refractor guys. We're we're sort of it's it's kind of a desert. Yeah. And you know, and for for the for the high um, high field of view guys like Gary. Okay, let's see if this works here. Hold on. Okay, so can you see this? Let's see. Oh, nice. Oh yeah. Ooh. Wow. I want to go to there. <laughs> <laughs> to the moon, Alice. One of these days. <laughs> and so, I guess, I don't think I have where we are, where we're looking, because it's sort of out of the field of view. Right, tonight. this is a few days younger moon than we're looking tonight. So, but wow, that's uh, that's some pretty smooth zoom in, in and out. and. Yeah. Incredible well, I think the service is called there. Zoom Into or something, and then I'm not sure what why this other stuff is showing up, but uh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, we've got, we've got that on on Universe today, just on the homepage right now, but uh, it's nifty. Uh, well, I think we're out of time, um, so why don't we sort of wrap things up? So, Gary, we didn't get Roy's view. Roy, what's this? Is this the Leo triplet? No. No, this is. The one down in the lower left is uh, NGC 4565, hmm. but the better one is the one up in the upper right, which is NGC 4631, or the Humpback Whale Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> that is a first. We have never seen the Humpback Whale Galaxy. <clears throat> That's another five minute, and I'm doing a seven minute right now. Well, okay. you're you're gonna have to do that one for your homework because yeah, I don't think well, it's only got video. another hundred seconds. Oh, cool. Yeah, or you know, post, posting down. pictures. Another hundred. Well, I'll keep going, and if I see an update, you let me know. Well, before I say goodbye to everybody. Wait, okay. wait, wait. Question: Is this an edge on? This doesn't even look like a disc. It just looks so messy, dusty. Must be edge yeah. on. It's just. Yeah, I mean, it's not. I mean, this wouldn't be a lenticular. Yeah. Um, the, f the fact that you can see that modeling in it is is a pretty good indicator of it being having new star it's formation. Perturbed. Yeah. yeah. You tend, it tends to be much more even if you have an elliptical. So. Okay. So then, yeah, it's definitely star formation then. All right. Well, I'm going to say goodbye to people. Andrew, thank you very much for joining us. And I'm not sure whether it's time to get up and go to work or whether it's time to go to bed. But you're uh, you're a trooper. <laughs> Yeah, just about. So I'll make some breakfast now. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, and uh, and so hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll see you next week, or but we're probably not going to be able to see you until the fall. Then that's point. it. You, you may lose me unless the the moon comes up and makes a nice a uh, blue moon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. Gary, thanks again. Thanks everybody. And Mark, congratulations on the new setup. That is just phenomenal. Well, it's, thank um, you. Hopefully, really I'll impressed. have it uh, better tuned ne for next time, so I can uh, get some good use out of these uh, light pollution filters instead of just making the moon look blue. <laughs> well, next week the moon should be out of our. No, it's going to be full. It's going to be full moon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's full on Thursday. So by Sunday, be three days past, four days. It'll past. be mostly full. Yeah, we, no, it will yeah. be okay. I think I think he's right because it it won't rise until we're pretty much done the star party. Right. Yeah. At least for West Coast people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Scott and Nicole, thank you so much for just remaining professional for as long as Always. you could. We knew <laughs> we we know it was a Herculean effort for you. You, you, know, you know, if you don't have fun with it, <laughs> what's the point? <laughs> uh, we yeah, we've got a whole bunch of hangouts coming out this yeah. week. Can you the, well, let people know what's going on? I think we're going to do Astronomy Cast tomorrow, hopefully. Everything. Yeah, new... I think you have Astronomy Cast, and it's Global Astronomy Month, so there's all sorts of things going on. We have yeah. learning, learning Space on Wednesday. Learning Space is on Wednesday. 
Oh, yeah, it's at a different time this week because we have uh, Thelina joining us from Astronomers Without Borders. And so being in a different time zone, uh, we're going to run it a little bit earlier. So check the, uh, check the CosmoQuest page for that, for the new time. Right. Uh, Planetary Society on Thursday, I believe. And we have Weekly Space, weekly space Hangout Friday. Friday. On Sunday in the early afternoon, so when, or 3 o'clock Pacific, I have a Science Sunday Hangout I'm doing with Budini on virology. So it will be quite awesome. And then the virtual star party that night. Awesome. All right. Uh, oh, there Roy, is. is that the update? That's the seven-minute whale galaxy. Yeah, you can definitely see a bit. little smudgy bit above it. That's another little yeah, galaxy. Little I don't know if it's kind of like what Andromeda has. That's a calf that's migrating with the whale. <laughs> 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 Dr. Stuart Foreman, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, and uh, and Dr. Thad Zabel, thanks a lot. Okay, thanks for having me. All right, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you all for the next thing, which I guess is tomorrow, which is going to be Astronomy Cast. So. Yes. yes. See you later. <laughs> <laughs>